A very good morning and good evening and a good afternoon to all of you. I think for some, it's even in the middle of the night. So it's, uh, it's really great to welcome you all to the CSW panel, uh, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. And I think the title is so well chosen that it probably attracted all of you to join. It's wonderful to see so many people from different parts in the world joining today. My name is Pascale Groothuis and I'm the ambassador for gender equality and women's rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it's an absolute honor to moderate today's session. I would like to thank all the organizers uh, for organizing this event. It's CREA, IWDA, GA, Jess, sorry, I should have pronounced it differently, Womankind Worldwide and others. And we will focus today on the importance of feminist toolkits to dismantle systems of patriarchal oppression and build feminist futures. And during this event, we will dive in into newly designed feminist toolkits presented by the organizations that are pre present with us today. And those toolkits have been designed with an intersectional feminist analysis to support movements and actors to create transformative change. I'm super proud to introduce to you today, the speakers of today. We have Sakina Rachid of CREA. We have Maureen Oliado of Femnet. And I think she's calling in from the middle of the night from New York. So bear with us and really happy that you could join us. We have Konteya Chan from Just Associates. We have Satara Hatirat from Backyard Politics Thailand. I hope we have Dina joining us or maybe she will join soon. And we have Bronwyn Tilbury of the International Women's Development Agency. Before we continue to the overview of the toolkits, I was asked to shortly share with you the Dutch perspective on feminist approaches to development. Promoting gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls in all the diversity has been a cross-cutting theme in our international trade and development policy since many years now. I believe in our development cooperation, it was early as 1976. Our foreign policy, um, I think, was added in the early 90s. We focus on issues such as equal and meaningful participation of women, also in leadership positions. We focus on sexual reproductive health and rights. We focus on the prevention of violence against women and girls and sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. We focus on education and empowerment of women and girls. And we have also are actively working on engaging men and boys in our work, as we all need to be on board if we need to make systemic changes. We have a so-called three pillar approach for promoting gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. The first pillar is the work that we do on women's rights through financing specific gender programs which I will elaborate on a little bit later, as some of you actually were working with. The second one is our work on gender mainstreaming, to put gender in the heart of our foreign policy and our development policy and our trade policy. We, have, we are a combined ministry with two ministers. One minister is the foreign affairs minister and the other one is the international trade and aid minister. We, may, we want to ensure that a gender lens is applied on human rights, on safety and stability, on foreign trade and development cooperation. Accountability and shared responsibility is key to achieve this. And thirdly, we actively push for gender equality in our diplomatic work, bilaterally through the EU, the UN, and in cooperation with the private sector and civil society. I would like to highlight two, which according to me are feminist, approaches to development, that show how we institutionalize and implement the promotion of gender equality and empowerment of women in all of our work. The first feminist approach derives from the fact that feminist movements and women's rights organizations are really, really underfunded. They receive only a tiny fraction of development assistance. And we want this to change. So the government of the Netherlands has therefore created the SDG5 fund the largest fund worldwide dedicated to gender equality, women's rights, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. In total, the Netherlands has allocated more than half a billion euros 
for the period of 2021 till 2025, through which we created 28 strategic partnerships with NGOs from the South. Through this support, we fund programs on empowering women, on women, peace and security, on sexual and reproductive health and rights, as well as the feminist Southern-led fund, which supports women's rights activism at grassroots level in the global South. The SDG 5 fund is not only about funding. The programs are set up as strategic partnerships between the implementing consortia organizations and the ministry. We seek to strengthen these strategic partnerships through a structural dialogue and shared lobby and advocacy. Important values for us are equal relations with the consortia members and also their local ownership. Within these partnerships, the ministry strives to work in a gender transformative way, looking into how to transform unequal power relations. Through this transformative approach, development policies become more sustainable and communities become more resilient. And we strive to do that with an intersectional lens, looking into how discrimination and privilege intersect, which help us to focus on those groups that are most marginalized. The second example, sorry, I'd like to uh, highlight is feminist approaches to development is our commitment to the UN Security Council resolution 1325. As you know, it's a landmark resolution on the importance of involving women in peace and security issues. It's more topical now than it has ever been with the crises in Afghanistan and in the Ukraine. The Netherlands has been active in implementing this agenda through the development of a national action plan on 1325, diplomacy and advocacy, and by funding standalone women peace and security programs. The Dutch Women Peace and Security Agenda is shaped through a very close and constructive cooperation between the government, different ministries, and civil society. In the Netherlands, 60 plus organizations are signatory to the National Action Plan. And together we are committed to a world in which equal and meaningful participation of women and girls in decision-making on peace and security is the norm, in which sustainable peace and development opportunities are achievable for all, and in which conflict-related violence against women, men, girls and boys has stopped. Drawing on the lessons learned from our previous National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, our programs and drawing on national and international development and studies, we developed and published recently the fourth National Action Plan 1325 in December 2020. Our National Action Plan is based on the four pillars of the Global Women, Peace and Security Agenda with strategic outcomes on participation, prevention, protection, on relief, re reconstruction and recovery. And we've added a fifth outcome on mainstreaming women, peace and security in order to ensure a more rigorous, effective implementation. I think I can go on for, for hours and hours on what we do and how proud we are. And there's a lot to, more to say uh, on feminist approaches to development. But I want to keep it short and leave enough room for the next part in which a brief overview of the different toolkits will be given. I'd like to give the floor to Crea first to introduce us all to their toolkit, all about power, all about movement, feminist movements. Sakina, could I give you the floor? Yes, you can. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, let me just share my screen because I will be uh, presenting three toolkits today. And to start off with, uh, why we chose three of our toolkits is because it is um, the most recent toolkits we have worked on and is written or co-written by a scholar, activist, trainer, and senior advisor at Kriya, Sri Lata Bhattiwala. And um, it's also written with um, movement actors and activists as, as part of the co-audience in mind. So All About Power, as the name suggests, talks about um, everything to do with power talks about the fact that we work um, to address injustices and exclusions, but do we truly understand that these are all expressions of power and, and stem down to um, power structures? And this is just a simple primer that breaks down. What is power? Where does it come from? How is it practiced? Um, and we then follow up with all about movements that follows up very specifically from all about power. After we discuss how we talk about power 
and how power plays a part in creating the injustices and exclusions that we are fighting against, how do we go about changing them? And why movements are the most effective way in really tackling power structures. And to come to the final toolkit, which is in three parts. This, um, so feminist leadership is essentially a very core part of Priya's work. Um, it is within our leadership our workshops, our trainings and institutes, but somewhere down the line, we realized that it wasn't always as easy for activists and trainers who are part of these workshops to then take these learnings and practice it in their own personal spaces, in their communities, in their work, and the need for sustained feminist mentorship a kind of um, a mentor, a feminist mentor to, to not teach or tell, but to support and guide um, an activist or a mentee, um, as, we, as we refer to these young women leaders. And while working on this program with the Global Fund for Women, um, we realized the lack of resources that specifically spoke about feminist mentoring guides. And that's when um, we decided to devise and really create this three-part feminist mentoring guide um, that speaks about it in theory in practice and specifically from the stories of mentors and the mentees. Thank you. Oh, Pascal, you're on mute. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. I was sipping okay. some coffee. It's uh, it's <laughs> quite early in the morning, so I was actually eating some coffee, and I wanted to spare you my uh, my noises. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, Maureen, can I maybe give you the floor, please? Um, Maureen of Femnet. Next, it was going to be uh, Kuntia, and I'm going to share a video on behalf of of Jess um, because Kuntia's in a. Black zone. I'll share it now. The R Rights R Safety Toolkit builds on the experiences of women activists to offer practical and interactive approaches that both deepen our understanding of context, power, and risk and help us develop collective strategies and practices which keep us safer and stronger as we defend human rights. It was created by Jazz in collaboration with the UN Special Rapporteur Michelle Forst and with the support of the International Service of Human Rights, Kalala Women's Fund, and Central American Women's Fund. What are its objectives? celebrate the struggles of women and feminists, and help human rights defenders feel part of a global women's movement for social justice. Contribute to a greater understanding and analysis of the violence faced by human rights defenders in every aspect of their lives, and promote collective and feminist protection strategies based on knowledge and experiences in different regions of the world. Help WHRDs identify different ways in which the UN Special Rapporteur Michelle Forst's report on women defenders can be used as a resource for advocacy and analysis to enhance their collective power and protection. This manual is intended for people who work at the local and community level, and particularly for human rights activists and defenders who are facing various and forms of violence in their struggle to build a more just world. It contains information and educational processes born of the valuable experiences and knowledge of women and their movements in different parts of the world, and is designed to help deepen the vision, analysis, and practices necessary to create a safer environment for the defense of human rights. The manual is a dynamic tool that must be adapted to the conditions, contexts, and resources of each group and participant, and serves as a tool to help people reflect on how defending human rights, including defending land and territories, can affect women's security and well-being. It is important to go beyond conventional protection measures that focus on safe houses and home security systems. We need to develop both individual and collective safety strategies which are more movement-based 
and feminist in their approach to protection. The manual would help bridge the gap between international mechanisms and grassroots communities and create more effective strategies. The toolkit is available in Bahasa Indonesia, Thai, Spanish, and English and is currently being translated to other languages so that women human rights defenders all over the world can utilize it in their organizing work. The R rights are... Wow, what an amazing, beautiful, beautiful video. Congratulations on that. Thank you. I just would like to and add it, that the, the language that we are uh, finalizing right now is Khmer, uh, Tagalog, and uh, Burmese. So there will be another three local languages in Southeast Asia will be public in the website. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it, it, um, your, your comments and also the comments in the, in the beautiful video on the languages, it also reminds me that uh, we asked beforehand, before this webinar, if there should be any translation available and we didn't hear back. So it's only in English, but if that causes any problems, I'm really sorry on, on, uh, on everybody's behalf. And thank you for making your video so very inclusive. It's a, it's a really beautiful example. Um, then I would like to go to Womenkind, Plan Your Power. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, I'm sure I already introduced me, so I don't have to use my time for that. Uh, and I'm sorry for joining a little late. Uh, I had problems connecting, uh, but I'm happy to be here nevertheless. So the toolkit I'm going to talk about is called Planning Your Power. It's a toolkit that was developed by Womankind Worldwide in joint collaboration with International Women Development Agency, IWDA. Uh, it focuses mainly on women's rights advocacy. So this toolkit is based uh, on women's rights to ap uh, approach to advocacy, which recognizes the need for long-term structure change for women's rights. Uh, they have to be fulfilled. Uh, uh, you have to take uh, that approach. Uh, and to also so, uh, to say that it was developed in really meaningful consultation with women rights organizations, feminist movements, and human rights defenders that we work with as womankind worldwide uh, and uh, IWDA, both in African region and in the Asian region. Uh, it drew a lot of it drew uh, a lot on existing resources developed by other organizations before. Uh, AWID, Gender Development Network, uh, among others. And so the purpose of this toolkit is really aimed at uh, supporting advocates to understand how to use women's rights approach to advocacy rather than just uh, advocating on women's rights issues. Uh, it focuses um, uh, on, on power, power analysis um, as, as, as a way of planning and carrying out advocacy. It recognizes that successful women's rights approach to advocacy depends on understanding the power um, and where it is located, how it operates in different contexts, but most importantly, also looking within in terms of how we also use power as advocates, as individual advocates or as organizations focusing on, on, on women's rights. Uh, so the power analysis really uh, includes uh, looking at the underlying, uh, the understanding the oppressive but also transformative power of, of feminist movements and, and, and women's rights organizations. And really what makes this toolkit different from, um, from other toolkits that we have seen, because they are mainly that focus on, on, on advocacy. So this one that really focuses on women's rights advocacy uh, planning is different because it understands, uh, as I have said, um, the gender the power in terms of how it operates understanding the oppressive power, the transformative power, who holds it, um, and how do we, how do we uh, work in ways that will challenge oppressive power and build transformative power. Uh, it tackles the structure, underlying structural causes of inequalities, 
um, and really looks at systems of oppression in terms of patriarchy, but also how patriarchy works with other systems of oppression such as capitalism, um, racism, and, 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 and other systems of oppression because we know that patriarchy doesn't work alone. Um, and, in, and, and really um, knowing that even the methods um, of, of, of carrying out advocacy, of planning advocacy even before it is carried out uh, are, are also political. And so using really strategies that are uh, inclusive, that are transformative, that centers the voices of those that are most marginalized and oftentimes excluded. But also uh, this uh, toolkit, um, is different because uh, it also recognizes that uh, when advocating on women's rights uh, issues and taking uh, women's rights approach to advocacy, uh, oftentimes we expect backlash. So it's not really a linear ap approach, but rather also knowing that backlash will happen and how sometimes we take you know three steps forward and take two uh, steps backwards. So how do we deal with that? And how do we assess risk? Uh, for such backlashes when they do happen, uh, and how do we share those risks as advocates? Uh, it also recognizes that uh, when building transformative power, um, uh, we must be inclusive, we must ensure that the voices of those that are most marginalized are at the center uh, of that. Um, and, 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 and it is really important that when building transformative power, it's important to work in the movements, in alliances, uh, with diverse, um, you know, uh, women and, and gender non-conforming people. Uh, but also uh, we know that to, to have um, successful women's rights advocacy, it's really important to support and resource women's rights organizations and movements in ways that is transformative, because we know that carrying out effective advocacy is also a long, a long term process. It takes a lot of time and a lot of resources, a lot of planning. But in terms of also thinking about resources, it also recognizes that while planning effective advocacy, it's really important to think about the existing resources, both in terms of money, but also time and context. Uh, but also really uh, it, 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 it talks about um, putting the priorities of women um, that, um, that face intersecting uh, marginalization and discrimination, uh, you know, based on gender, uh, identity, sexual orientation, on uh, disabilities, on race, on age, uh, that the priorities of, 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 of women that are facing intersecting discrimination need to be uh, put uh, at the center. Uh, of, of, of advocacy. So we have a link uh, which I'll, I will share in the chat, if that's okay, uh, to find out more information around this toolkit. And uh, I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very clear presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to invite Bronwyn um, of the International Women's Development Agency to present your toolkit. Thanks so much, Pascal. Um, and uh, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll um, just share my screen. Hang on a second. Can you all see that? Yes? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so just building on um, what Dina was saying um, about the Plan Your Power Toolkit, that's, that's it there. Um, we were really proud to develop this toolkit in collaboration with Womankind Worldwide. Um, RWDA now delivers three to five day um, advocacy training workshops um, to organisations based on this uh, Plan Your Power methodology. Um, the workshops provide participants with um, a collective framework to think about women's rights in their context context and to design a strategic advocacy plan. Um, it takes the organisation through each stage of the advocacy planning process um, and at the end of the workshop the team will have a comprehensive strategic advocacy plan ready to implement. So that sits alongside the, the toolkit that you can pick up and, and do the same thing with yourself if you wish. After a few times of running that workshop, however, we reflected on the diversity of participants, um, including their different skills and their learning styles um, and their level of knowledge and experience with advocacy. And we also reflected on the inherent 
power imbalances that exist in organisations, even in feminist ones. So we wanted um, every participant to feel prepared and able to contribute in each of these advocacy planning workshops. So what we did was develop an online learning um, course on the fundamentals of feminist advocacy planning uh, that participants can complete at their own pace prior to coming to a workshop or prior to undertaking an advocacy planning process. Um, the online course adopts a storytelling methodology um, and it uses multimedia and quizzes to keep it engaging and to support um, self-assessment on the key ideas around advocacy principles. Um, and that online uh, workshop and the workshop development um, was all generously funded and supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. And uh, another um, toolkit that we were able to develop at IWDA with the generous support of the Netherlands was the Feminist Organisational Capacities Strengthening Toolkit, which is a toolkit that we're really proud of. Um, it was launched last year. IWDA believes that stronger feminist organisations are better able to establish and participate in strong, healthy feminist movements and create the kinds of worlds that we want to, the kinds of world that we want to see. Um, and so that's why we developed the Feminist Organisational Capacity Strengthening Toolkit, or FOX, as we call it for short. Um, and we developed this toolkit in collaboration with our partner organisations across Asia and the Pacific and with the Gender at Work Associates Group. Um, part of the proposition of FOX is the importance of recognising and challenging unequal power relations inside our organisations, cultures and practices. Um, and when we challenge those, we will make organisations better prepared to recognise and transform power inequality in the world. Um, FOX is designed to support organisations to better align their internal practice with their feminist principles so that they are better able to make the contributions to the world that they seek to make. Uh, the toolkit includes a backgrounder, uh, a facilitation handbook, um, an organisational capacity self-assessment module, a leading, governing and being accountable for women's rights organisations module, a feminist resource mobilisation module. Um, as you say, Pascal, women's rights organisations are woefully underfunded around the world and we're very grateful for donors like yourself, but there needs to be more. So this resource um, really uh, helps organisations to, uh, to develop plans around collective advocacy for that kind of thing and to raise money for themselves. And uh, creating cultures of care and resilience mod module. Um, you can pick up the toolkit by yourself and um, uh, run it in your organisation. But again, RWDA has developed um, a set of two to four day online workshops to support organisations to implement Fox um, for themselves. And um, it's it's ideal for if organisations their strategic planning um, processes um, and we be really keen to hear from people who would be interested in talking to us more about those workshops. Thanks, Pascal. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm really impressed actually by all the different toolkits. And I think it's great help for all the organizations in this webinar, but also outside this webinar to, uh, to learn more about. So it's, um, uh, it, it's really inspiring to see. Um, if, and I already see it's happening, but if you have any Q and A's, you can put them in the chat as we speak. I see that there's some of them are coming in, so that's really helpful and we will uh, definitely touch upon them later. Um, also, we would love to hear it. I mean, we just heard from four terrific organizations, but I, I think I saw something in the, in the chat already um, that there are more toolkits because we obviously, we don't have the oversight of all of them. So it would be really, really helpful if you have any feminist resources or toolkits or other materials that you would like to share, please do so. And I think that's the value uh, amongst the other things of this webinar. So please share um, interesting, usable, uh, relevant stuff in the chat. Um, then we will go to uh, distinguished uh, speakers for a few questions, because I think we had great presentations, but there's always more to ask, more to learn. 
Um, I just saw that Dina left. Is that correct or not? I think she's still here. We just can't see her. Okay. Well, that, I, I, that dropped, is... I dropped off, but I'm back. Ah, very good. We wouldn't go on without you. So I'm happy to see you again. Perfect. Um, I would love to ask a question actually to uh, Sakina and to Bronwyn about the different toolkits, just to make sure to, the, to all the uh, participants, but what would be the difference between a feminist toolkit and a gender equality toolkit? And I know we have this discussion in our ministry all the time. People really go easy about um, um, gender equality. I think everybody sees that. But then if we talk about the word feminist in my ministry, some of the colleagues um, think it's a, it's a concept of the, of the 70s and everything. So I would love, love, love to hear from you. What is the difference between a feminist toolkit and a gender equality toolkit? Sakina, could I give you the first floor? Sure, I can start. Um, so when thinking about a feminist toolkit and a gender equality toolkit, um, I would say that the first thing is not just about what is being said, but about how it is being said. And feminist toolkits, you know, embrace the practice of feminism in both its content and physical design. And maybe it's because I'm from the communications team, but may, let me start with the physical design. But to start off with just the structure, you know, how is it presented? How is it written? Are you writing to your audience? Is it easily readable? Can you take, you know, can your reader take this concept and actually translate it into their own work? Um, are complex ideas and concepts put in a way that makes them accessible? including um, to on the ground um, grassroots level activists and uh, illustrations if illustrations are used what is the thinking behind it the politics that connected to your work and your toolkit and what you're discussing the languages the toolkits are available in all about movements and all about power we have it in English Hindi Nepali and Bengali but we're realizing that we need to keep this conversation going about what languages our toolkits are available in and then accessibility in all of its forms forms uh, from language to also um, including image descriptions or all text um, if it's in what format is it um, if it's digital if it's digital um, can it be easily downloaded um, can it be easily shared and what can you do to continue improving this as you develop more and more toolkits um, so these are some of the questions when we think about just the physical design of the structure and and thinking that the content or the structure that the content is in is designed to truly bring people in bring people into what you're trying to say and then coming to the content I would say that um, trans uh, feminist toolkits really transforms ourselves to practice feminism while we're um, writing the toolkit, talking about the toolkit and using the toolkit. Um, it forces you to look at the issue, but not just, just the symptoms, but really look at the root cause and go beyond into your personal spaces, recognizing that the structures of injustice that you're trying to tackle do not stop at the door of our private and most intimate spaces. And um, to, to continue with content, you know, again, it has to be easy to relate to, it reaches your intended audience. Um, think about your context. If you're working in the global South, you're, and you're writing for the global South, are you addressing, um, you're using examples and case stories um, from the global South, um, using charts and examples, again, questions. Uh, some of our toolkits also have a little, little box where you just you, it's a little exercise it forces you to take a take a deep breath just think about it just think about your own power and how you're exercising it um and i really think that this helps connect the personal to the political and case studies have really helped a reader understand feminism not just as an abstract level of theory but truly what it's like in practice and um, another value that we have at CREA is, is um, about uh, multi-generational values and how is this um, within our toolkits we speak about this as a value in our work but this should be reflected it, it should not just be a um, top to bottom instructional approach but be inclusive and transform transformative and the idea behind toolkits it's just not that gender equality is embedded into the work that we're doing, but that our, our primers and guidebooks are more political in the sense that they interrogate power at all steps, interrogate our own practices, our own ideas, our behaviors, the baggage that we carry, um, so that it's not just a, an apolitical reading of how to embed gender or a gender lens in what, the work that we do, but a deeper interrogation of, of why and how. 
I, I have a very personal metaphor that I use when I started to understand, you know, toolkits and feminist toolkits. And I think about it as if you're looking into a pool and that pool is, is your metaphor for um, injustice, exclusion or other issues that you're trying to tackle. Um, I would say you can look at the pool and you can um, examine it and study it and identify it and you can write a toolkit about it. Or you can immerse yourself, really just jump yourself into the pool yeah. and, and truly try and understand everything around it and how the pool and you connect and, and then how you would take this and then practice it in your work and your communities. Um, I will stop there. Thank you. I think your metaphor about the pool is, is I can totally see it. So it's a, it's a really good one. And I also loved your um, talking about the multi-generational uh, um, perspective. That's why I actually have a, I, I say mini me, but that's, that's uh, devaluing her. But she is 24 and she is the youth ambassador for sexual rights, sexual and reproductive health and rights and bodily autonomy. And we share the platforms. I think uh, today was a little bit too early for her, but otherwise I would have loved to share it. But we find it really important also to have the younger generation part of our advocacy, but also part of our policy processes. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, Bronwyn, can I ask you the same question? Yes, again, I love that pool analogy. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> so yeah, me too. Such a good one. Um, so when I was thinking about this question, I thought there were sort of four ways in which I think a feminist approach or a feminist toolkit is different to just a gender equality one. I think the first one is around a feminist approach really engages with power, not just gender. So it makes it possible for um, us to see and challenge unequal power relations and harness alternative forms of power more inclusive, transformative forms of power. So, for example, the Plan Your Power Toolkit takes as its starting point uh, an activity on understanding and using power to ensure that all participants have a similar understanding of power and how it operates um, before they even start thinking about what their advocacy campaign might be about. Um, the second one is around, similar to what Sakina was saying, it's the how of what you're doing is just as important, if not more important than what your outcome um, might be. So if you make question the question of how a program is implemented or a, a piece of work that you're doing uh, is, is the process of that is done, central to achieving that goal, then you're avoiding, you're hopefully avoiding unintentionally reproducing the systems of power and equality that you're actually trying to address through your program or your project. Um, so that's why, you know, um, planning or um, an advocacy campaign or examining your own organisational strength uh, takes into account that power dynamic um, in the actual process of the workshops and the analysis itself. Um, I think we all know the third, you know, the the, the root of a feminist approach is that you look at systems and structures, not just the symptoms of those systems. So um, you, and, and someone else mentioned this earlier, you're looking at systems of inequality. So the patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism, those kinds of systems when you're um, analysing a problem rather than um, just a narrow or a shallow um, understanding of inequality between men and women. And then finally, um, that intersectional lens, I think, is, is fundamental to a feminist approach. Um, so, you know, addressing multiple systems of oppression and inequality um, and allowing them to, uh, allowing us to better recognise those overlapping sources of discrimination. Um, and uh, I think that's uh important when you're going through a process that is feminist that you're constantly having that that intersectional and that power lens on what you're doing and that's what these feminist things that we're profiling today um, do so well I think. Thank you very much I think it's it's very clear and I was wondering maybe Bron just to um, to become very concrete but what did it change in did you do it in your organization and what did you find what did you change? 
Uh, we, we have done it in our own organisation. That was one of our intentions from the very beginning, um, that this toolkit would be as helpful, hopefully, to ourselves as it would be to partners and others around the world. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that when we did the self-assessment on IWGA, um, it was, you know, going through a, a feminist process that um, was democratic, that, that brought everyone um, into the room to express their opinions on what was happening in the organisation, it identified that the issue, the most important priorities for the organisation that everyone kind of knew in their bones were issues that we wanted to work on. Um, and those were things like um, looking at our, our um, approach to diversity and inclusion and looking at our uh, the kinds of culture that we were creating around collective and self-care um, and approaching uh, the ways in which decision making was was happening in our organization and that's the kind of transformative yeah. that you don't necessarily get when you're doing a strategic planning process that's sort of based on um, you know the corporate uh, model um, yeah, true. yeah thank Thanks. you very much thank you um I maybe other speakers want to contribute to uh, this question, and otherwise I will go to the next question. Just looking around the table. No, then I will go to the next question, um, and we have plenty of questions coming. Um, Maybe a question for uh, Maureen and uh, Satara, Maureen of Femnet and Satara of Backyard Politics in Thailand. What examples can you give of how taking a feminist approach has contributed to your feminist agenda? Um, Maureen, do you, do you want to go first? <laughs> okay, no problem. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the support of the European Union, Femnet has been implementing a project aimed at nurturing the capacities of women rights organizations in the continent for policy influencing on gender equality and women empowerment. And we were privileged to use the FOX tool that uh, Bronwyn um, talked about, the Feminist Organizational Capacity Strengthening Toolkit. And one of the things about um, the toolkit from our experience was the fact that it does not assume that women rights organizations don't have capacities and that they are therefore lacking and in need of skills, but rather there's the acknowledgement that um, they have inherent capacities and um, their record of defending uh, women's rights, um, you know, before everything was institutionalized and designed to fit maybe our funding partner requirements, et cetera, um, is appreciated. And um, also um, the thing about using the toolkit was the appreciation as well that um, women rights organizations and the staff therein are agents of change and solution provider providers. And the freedom that is derived from this appreciation um, then affords women rights organizations, the ability to not only focus on investing in technical capacities, uh, which is what you see happens a lot with um, mainstream um, approaches for uh, organizational development, but also focusing on soft skills, including interpersonal relationships, you know, realizing that these are just as important in terms of strengthening the women's movement in, in Africa. Um, something else that I can give as an example from my experience of um, using the toolkit was um, that, you know, using um, the feminist approach um, then helped the women rights organizations that we are working with as Femnet to define their own path and identify their own strengths and weaknesses without having to, to follow, you know, prescribed um, frameworks that were not necessarily uh, contextual. Um, something else that stood out is that, um, you know, the dignity of the approach in terms of allowing them to be at the driver's seat, then gives them an opportunity to speak to their realities, um, including the reality to 
enhance uh, useful and sometimes often ignored capacities around self-care and the need for functional and fit for purpose policies. So I'll give an example of one of the young feminist organizations that we worked with um, using this approach was able to develop um, organizational policies that really spoke to the reality and politics um, of young feminist organizing and uh, policies that recognize the limitations and context that girl and young led um, organizations um, face when they are doing their day to day work. Um, something else um, that we found of, of benefits was the fact that, you know, a feminist approach, um, like we've heard from the other speakers, it values diversity and inclusion. And so um, our members really benefited, um, the women's rights organizations that we are working with really benefited by being intentional in terms of evaluating to what extent, to what extent their um, organizations are walking the talk when it came to being inclusive. And an example that I can think of specifically around this was um, after we engaged, worked with them using the Fox tool, um, some of our partners uh, were quite brave in challenging, you know, funding partner requirements that stifle inclusion and diversity. So um, the small big things, you know, like um, how we have activity registration forms that only allow for you to sign in as either male or female, you know, um, how sometimes funding partners uh, disregard the right to anonymity, especially for girls and young women who don't wish to disclose um, information that can be used to identify them. So these are just some of the um, uh, things that came came out after we used the, uh, you know, this approach in terms of um, helping those partners to um, evaluate their capacities. And um, I think maybe just lastly, just to say that um, because we are using a feminist approach, then there's a greater focus on ensuring that um, women rights organizations have the capacity to identify inequalities. Um, and this is speaking to what Browning had, had said that um, it helps us uh, go deeper. And when you go deeper, then you're able to address um, any gaps uh, using locally informed solutions as opposed to you know, solutions that may not necessarily work in terms of the context um, that you are working in. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen, for your very uh, great insights, actually, on how this helps you, but also the women and girls we're all working with. Thank you. Sathara, can I ask you the same question? What examples? I would have, yes, I would have to say I agree with everyone. And um, to reinforce what everybody has said in my own words, I would say, um, we we were using DAS as tools, and um, I find that uh, the the feminist tool support us to be true to ourselves and to really hear the truth in our friends in our community. And I truly believe this is all time empowerment for us who are mostly people who are made voiceless and selfless, how to be true to ourselves that was taken away and how feminist to help us to be true to ourselves. I think first is because like everybody said, it really takes reality seriously. It takes what uh, has been created um, for, from patriarchal society um, the biases, the baggages, and the wounds in people, the tool recognizes these and then deliver a learning environment that, yes, uh, it challenges what needs to be challenged, but it also supports what needs to be supported. And I think that's very important. And supporting is what we um, usually forget, and it's a form of um challenge how we challenge patriarchy and secondly the the feminist tools recognize individual reality and reality in our current context 
what's really happening inside and outside of, of each of us and affirm our feelings and experiences. And in for example, um, my kid is calling me right now. I need to go and uh, tend to my cat kettles or I am burnt out and I am low in energy being here today. It, it welcomes all feelings or reality of each individual. And in this kind of process, marginalized women and LBQ people feel safe and supported and not in many processes that we could really be ourselves and that all feelings that we have are respected and then thirdly when people feel safe and supported they recognize what is true for themselves and the collective learn together what is true for us because there is a place for it to manifest and you don't have to twist it into something else that our people say this is more true so we create knowledge that is true for both ourselves as a person and our collective and our context. And then um, our friends here have said that my fourth point, feminist tools show and not tell. Um, and that, that is what matters for real people's learning, I think, it, for creating new ways to be. Like, if you think about how you learn things in this world and how you learn your cultures and the way to think and to behave, and no one tells us any theories growing up, we learn from what we see, hear, and feel from other people around us. And if we want to unlearn the old power abused ways, we need to do things in a non power abused way and what i'm saying is still a theory and in practice sometimes we have been so abused that we do not recognize it it is abuse and we have been so unequal that we do not recognize inequality and feminist tools take all these things deeply into learning and show what not abuse feels like and so my take on it is that feminist tools give power back to women and marginalized people instead of taking it away and when it is done effectively um, you can see power sparkling in people's eyes and them ready to move forward taking initiatives People like to do things when they feel powerful and when they start doing things, you can see that they do it in the new ways that they have learned by their experiences. And they have experienced how it is done, not just listening to its theories. And feminist tools make it their own experiences. One of my friends said you cannot understand feminism unless you are living it you cannot learn it from books and this kind of tool allow you to lift it people not only learn about gender or feminist issues in a feminist process using a feminist tool they experience how life in equality feels like what they feels like what it means to have your whole life and you as a whole person respected what it means when your voices no matter how you use them matter it shows how your experiences count and you can see from your own eyes or hear from your own ears how now you are really contributing into knowledge a uh, collective knowledge and if you feel any bit um empowered by what i have just said i think your heart is responding to elements in feminist tools and that is how we learn and change um using this kind of tool instead of just talking about 
um, gender equality. It has transformed myself, my colleagues, and people in my network. Especially, I, I see that this especially matters when things are tough and we feel so exhausted fighting and we feel so isolated. These tools remind us how um, what we dream of, how a new world feels like and it can actually happen because it's happening right now and in this circle that we are doing this process. Um, it's not only the knowledge in this in this kind of process. I feel it's not we are showing is not only the knowledge that matters, but also how knowledge is constructed and how the knowledge really resonates to to us. Uh, we are women and marginalized people of the global south and how knowledge resonates to who we truly are. I think it's very important because much of the knowledge we are made to use does not come from us, but from the West, the men and the groups in power and great feminist tools in my experience of using it with my community, um, it unlocks not only what we think, but our experiences and our soul. It, it proves to you that not only the knowledge matters, but, but you matter. And I think that is how a movement is made. And in, I want to give two examples of how it benefits us. First, it bridged a youth activists and older activists together easily when, when things were tough for the both sides. And second, I saw that it could bring back friends who burned out um, back to, to feeling lively about working again. Thank you. Thank you, Satara. Um, I can disclose this. This is my first reading of the week, but I feel so inspired just by listening to you um, and by all the other previous speakers as well. But I think you so simply, but so well explained what a difference is between um, a feminist approach and what it, what it entails to be, how it makes you feel, how it contributes to collective wisdom, um, um, and and why uh, it matters so much. So thank you so much for being so clear uh, in in what it would be and uh, why would we would all actually um, and I think we all are are trying to live it and living it. Uh, but why actually the whole world needs a feminist approach. But maybe I'm getting a little bit too activist here. Um, I think there was a question also about uh, uh, mentoring. Uh, and I feel actually like this whole webinar is, is also a bit mentoring to all of us who are doing work in the field that it's not always easy. And I think, uh, Sakina, you said it, it's sometimes three steps, oh no, Maureen said it, three steps ahead and then two steps back. And it's it's quite tiring and challenging. But I believe that with all the, all the people in this call, um, we can definitely make a difference and make an impact. And we should stick together. And I think it's also about the collective wisdom. I think that resonated very much with me, Satara, that um, by knowing and feeling and, and working together, I think uh, we can make a difference. So I don't know if anybody can maybe put in the chat if there's any great mentoring programs. Um, I'm sure we all, I've been mentored and it helped me a lot. And I'm now giving back by mentoring other people. Um, and I'm sure you're all doing that. Um, but if there's any information, please put it in the chat. Um, but I would like to know, uh, and maybe um, uh, Sakina and, and Satara, you could shed a light on that, is what are some of the top tips for groups and people wanting to apply a feminist approach to their programs of work? So who who are thinking about it. So what kind of tips or suggestions would you have to give them? Sakina, could I give it to you first? Sure. Um, I'm, still, I'm still thinking about a, a lot of things that uh, Sarah yeah, also brought up. Too. 
Yeah, and and I love how um, you spoke about uh, this kind of thinking about the challenges, but thinking about you know the supportive um, side of toolkits. Uh, one of my favorites. I think I'll, I'll pick from this. But top tips, I, I would say, um, think about think about just your process um, and and the, the feminist approach that you are thinking about that from from start to to the end and it never really ends um, is it a consultative and collaborative uh, process um, for example resources on young people should be written um, with someone young on board um, avoid the the savior gears um, do not think that that um, there's, there's there's no thing called persons without voices um, it is just not the spaces for persons to amplify their voices um, use uh, you also again going back to kind of your structure using open-ended questions and prompts um, case stories um, and then the uh, Bronwyn also touched on this on the, the process when you begin um, your feminist approach um, if it's your toolkit and then from taking the toolkit to your programs who do you bring to the table um, what sessions do you have if it's uh, focus group discussions or thought sessions and to really think about the why the why you're doing the program why are you trying to communicate this and um, if we have these four P's that we talk about um, it's, uh, and it's really kind of impact, impacted our feminist work. So if it's politics and purpose, what we believe in, our vision for, our, for a better social order, um, and then a purpose, the social goals and change that emerge from this vision. Um, if it's principles and values, that's the second P, our values that spring from this vision of the world that we want to see, this beautiful feminist future that we are working towards and have come so far, uh, because it is not a perfect world, uh, because a perfect world cannot be realized unless it is shaped by certain values and principles. And then the third P is our personal and organizational power. We always come back to power. Power, the use of power, the abuse of power that derails our purpose, our principles and practices. And of course, practice. Um, taking from these three Ps, if we are aligning our practices to our values, to how we understand personal and organizational value and politics and purpose. Um, so I would say thinking about these, these four Ps, um, in your programs, in your toolkits, in both your programs and in your toolkits, and really embracing the kind of feminist approach is um, is definitely, uh, I would say, a starting point and something to continue from the start to the end. Thank you. I think those uh, four P's are really applicable to all organizations. I, I wrote them down myself too. Thank you. Um, Satara, could you maybe give some tips for organizations who want to start a feminist um, approach or working in a feminist way? I will add uh, to what Sakina has said. Um, the first thing that uh, we would consider as important is when we hold a space, it should feel safe for everybody in that space. and. And the, the way we do this is that we uh, are particular about who share the same time and space all at once. Um, so it's not about how many people you can involve all at once because we want to be as inclusive as we, we are. But in a certain space, we can we can choose people, it's like holding a party where people can socialize by themselves and then knowledge comes from that. If they feel safe and relaxed, um, trust that people will be able to connect to their knowledge and share freely. Um, so who comes to the space at the same time uh, matters for us. And secondly, I, I would say remind ourselves be organizers that it's not only about us or our agenda and it's not about the goal that we see uh, uh, with light in in front of us but it's also how how people are are walking with us and sometimes they like to take a rest or they're not there yet and that's okay as long as we we are nurturing um, the path with them. I think that, that these are um, two very important points for 
for us to share. Thank you very much. I think they're very valuable points. Um, I think actually I am going to ask all the members of all the speakers uh, the same question because I think it's really useful for all the people in the webinar to learn about the best tips. We have so much collective wisdom uh, around the table that I would love to uh, to hear more. So I'm I'm going to uh, Kuntea. Could you maybe also give some tips and suggestions on uh, the same question? Thank you. Um... Yeah, I mean, uh, so many things have said already, and I just like to add um, the, maybe one or two things that really, you know, give us. Um, I think we, we dare to dream a, a different world that is better than we are living in this system, because I think most of the time we are so fragile uh, and have sometimes we also hopeless um, with, with the system and the structure we are in. But we need to be able to dream and visioning our uh, our hope. So I think that's also uh, something important for us to really integrate it in our process. And also, like the way that we are building the collective uh, knowledge from the experience from the ground, because most of the time, the way that we, we use the family perspective in our work is not just only um, you know, for the gender equality, but also the whole society that is getting better. So how we really using the experience on the ground to break the inequality of our society that mostly give it to the, the academic, to the high level, you know? So how are we building those experience and also use it as a very critical reflection and create a new knowledge that we can together bear our action to transform uh, you know, the, the patriarchal and the power in our society. And also remember that we are human beings. We, we are human beings. So we need to build the sense of the community that we can be together and create the space. Because I think sometimes we, we forget about it. So when we go back to that, and who is, who is matter? Who is matter in our movement? So I think that is uh, the heart that how because sometimes a lot of people using participatory approach uh, family popular education for example but then how the way and the how you know how how they they include those people sometimes they create the plan strategy and just present it to the people and they say that this is participatory so how are you doing it is important how are you really include those people in the process and organize the space that can be a, a strengthening or explore their potential. Actually, they already have their own potential. Explore it, organize it, and we build the collective power from some that experience. So I think that is important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and again, the global, or the global, not the global, but the collective wisdom or the collective knowledge is, is so key. Um, Maureen, could you maybe talk about your tips for um, uh, organizations that want to start a feminist approach, but also maybe um, there might also be challenges or there might also be, um, it's probably not all easy going. So if, if you have a lessons learned that like, you would like to share, that would be really welcome as well. It's up to you. Um, thank you, thank you so much. So I think one, one of the things I would say is, um, we, don't, we shouldn't be afraid, you know, to unpack and dismantle and reconstruct. And, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to say, you know, this, this isn't working. Um, because uh, especially looking at um, organization capacities strengthening, uh, we have for so long worked with very heavily corporate oriented or um, funding partner uh, biased, you know, um, approaches and uh, processes. And so, um, you know, having that as a baseline, then it means if, if you're going to ensure that you're applying feminist approaches, then you have to be brave enough to say this isn't working for us and we want to do something different. Um, we want to not only focus on process, but we are... Um, sorry, we, we, we are not, um, you know, just focusing on the outcomes or the end game, but we are also as heavily invested in the process. So I think uh, being brave enough to um, say when 
when it's not working and uh, being brave enough to um, to create new ways uh, of doing things is one of the top tips uh, maybe I'd, I'd be able to share. Thank you, that's beautiful. Um, it's about dreaming and it's about being brave and it's about doing and it's about the process. I think it's, it's, uh, it's very valuable. Dina, could I ask you to take the floor? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I agree with what other speakers have said and uh, my contribution would be definitely to emphasize the what, like why are we doing what we want, which, which feminist future do we want to see in this world? Um, and to achieve that, it's really important to work with those um, that, that, you know, um, that we actually, we know that the current world isn't working for. And so they are even more interested in that, in that feminist future. And so how do we work collectively with them, taking our collective actions? At Womankind, like every, uh, everything we do in terms of our strategy, it focuses on building movements. And we know that um, with movements, uh, we have more power we have transform a more transformative power to be clear uh, to actually bring about change. And, um, and the other third thing I want to say is also the internal reflection uh, that I think oftentimes as advocates, we tend to look at what is not working and, and really calling uh, others to account, but maybe find it difficult to um, hold ourselves accountable. And I think we need to also as feminist movements and organizations, we need to start looking at ourselves. And so my tip for anyone who wants to take a feminist approach is start with yourself, look at your own own practices and look at your own policies and systems and see if indeed it is actually doing what you are calling others to do. Um, whether we talk about inclusivity, how are we inclusive ourselves in our own organizations? Uh, if we talk about collective power, how are we ourselves sharing power within organizations? How are we making sure that we are addressing structures of power that sit in our own organizations, uh, you know, um, and, and so the internal reflection is extremely important and that's what we've been doing at Womankind with the opportunity of the new strategy where we're actually saying, can you look at ourselves? Can you start to decolonize our own practices? Can you start sharing the power and how does that then look like? And, and can you have these conversations with the partner that we work with in the global south to know really what sharing power is and, and how we can do it in a way that is actually really useful to everyone. Um, yeah, and definitely I think I like Maureen's um, point around being brave, because if you're working on systemic change and structural change, you definitely need to be brave. And we have seen feminist um, act, uh, activists and, and, and human rights defenders really being, being brave. And so uh, can we all be brave together? And I think being brave means that, you know, that will be stronger if we also are all of us willing to share uh, risks. Because oftentimes, <laughs> some of us might be best somewhere where it is self, uh, but how are we sharing risk with those that are the front line? Um, you know, because um, then if you're not sharing the risk, it means we're not really being brave enough uh, to, to, to bring about systematic change. I need to be patient with ourselves because change does, this kind of change won't happen in a few years. It's, it's a long game. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. I think the, the point you make about sharing risk, um, I think it's an excellent point. And I think we're all working with women rights defenders and it, it's, um, it's so important also to stand in solidarity with the ones on the front lines. Um, so thank you for making that point really valuable. Uh, Bronwyn, can I give you the floor, please? Yeah, thank you, Pascal. This is a really interesting question. So great to have everyone's perspectives. Um, I think the one that I wanted to touch on was um, the way uh, we put it in the, the FOX modules was to prepare for depth. Um, when you're taking a feminist approach, you're inevitably going to be talking about power. And um, that can be emotional, especially when you're working with co oppressed communities um, and communities who come up against power and, and powerlessness on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, we all do. 
that can be emotional. That's that's deeply felt. That's embodied um, stuff. And so when you're planning a process that is feminist, you need to anticipate that there will be depth and there will be emotion. And what are you going to do? What ground rules are you going to set around when that comes up? And what grounding exercises might you plan to um, to bring people back into themselves? Um, what kinds of processes might you build in so that you can lean into that conversation about power even though it's making people uncomfortable because it might might lead to some transformation um yes that would be my top tip prepare for depth thank you very much um and i think we've all had those discussions um and there will be many of those discussions coming along um I think actually we could go on for hours and it feels like there's a, there's a, a sisterhood or a friendship, uh, uh, even though we're on the online. Um, but I think actually we're getting at the end of uh, this webinar, but I think it, it definitely asks for more to come. Um, I don't see any pertinent questions in the, in the chat. I see many comments and many comments of support to all the speakers. So I think uh, it's a, uh, um, great tips by all the speakers and I think there's a lot of um, learning and wisdom uh, forming going on so with that um, I, I am inspired for the for the month to come and maybe uh, maybe even longer but I, I learned so much from all this all the speakers and from the toolkits uh, but also from the very personal um, experiences that were shared um, I think the feminist approach is about the how, it's about being true to yourself, about being true to other people. It's about power. Um, it's about persistence because it's not going to take uh, uh, only a few days or weeks. It's about patience. It's about perseverance. And I think we're all doing it together. So that gives me great hope. And I hope um, you feel the same. I would love to thank all of you both the audience and the panelists for being with us in this webinar and sharing your knowledge and your very wise words with us. I hope you are all as inspired by the ideas and practical tools provided today as I am. Um, the, the toolkits um, that were presented so well today and that you can find online and in the chat uh, can help to capacitate the organizations and, and yourselves and um, to become stronger and to be better able to establish support and strengthen various feminist movements and approaches. And just from a very personal point of view, um, the Dutch government is here to support you. So if you need feedback or you want to reach out, you can do it to us, but also to the embassies abroad and to all the brilliant partners that were on the, on the call today. Um, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 I don't want to say goodbye. I don't know how it is with you, but I don't want to leave. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>